Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining this session where we are very lucky to be joined by Todd Havkost from IntelliMagic. He'll be walking us through processor, processor cache optimizations from the Z15 upgrade and we'll be going through some case studies as well. As a reminder, um, please feel free to drop in your questions as we go along in the chat box and Todd will answer them towards the end of the presentation. And I will also drop a link where you can um, write some session or presentation feedback as well towards the end. And with that said, over to you, Todd. Great, thank you very much. Welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to this session on uh, optimizing uh, processor cache from uh, Z15 upgrade uh, case studies. Um, so uh, in this session, we're gonna start out uh, by discussing the key processor cache concepts and metrics that provide the foundation for uh, understanding the vital role processor cache plays uh, in CPU consumption on today's Z processors. Um, there's a lot of continuity between the Z13, 14, and 15, but we'll examine the key changes in processor cache design uh, in the 14 and 15 that have contributed to performance uh, improvements and improvements in uh, delivered capacity. Uh, then we'll review two case studies uh, showing the impact uh, on of Z15 upgrades in a couple of uh, sites uh, to their delivered capacity. And then we'll introduce uh, several potential opportunities that you may have to reduce CPU uh, through processor cache efficiency by maximizing the work that's executing on vertical high uh, logical CPs through optimizing LPAR weights and also optimizing cache through increasing the number of physical uh, CPs. And then we'll, that will also, we'll have one more case study there uh, that will also show significant benefits that resulted from one uh, such uh, initiative. So most of the metrics uh, in this presentation come from the SMF 113 records produced by the CPU measurement facility. Uh, those metrics are essential to analyzing uh, hardware performance. And so it's very, it's very important to be collecting those and to have good visibility uh, into this data. All right, first metric, uh, cycles per instruction, CPI, that represents the average number of processor cycles spent per completed instruction. Uh, and just conceptually, processor cycles are spent either productively, actually executing the work uh, uh, in your uh, business workload, or unproductively waiting to stage data uh, due to level one cache or translation look aside buffer uh, misses. So keeping the processor productively busy, executing your business instructions is uh, highly dependent on effective uh, utilization of processor cache. Now, I said a minute ago conceptually because the uh, Z architecture has all kinds of really sophisticated things going on in the background with out of order execution and other pipeline enhancements to try to minimize that unproductive waiting. All right, so this chart uh, from Telemagic Vision product breaks out cycles per instruction into those productive and unproductive components we just mentioned. Uh, the space above the blue and below the red line on this chart represents those productive cycles. Uh, it would, that's the, that would be the CPI value if all required data and instructions were always present uh, in level one cache. And so it's called the instruction complexity. CPI reflects the mix of simple and complex uh, machine instructions in your business workload. Now it may be impacted by migrations to new processor technologies that incorporate internal improvements in the processor architecture, may be improved by recompiling programs with compiler options that take advantage of new instructions that are available on newer processors, but otherwise it's likely to be relatively constant based on the workload uh, in your environment. But since there is a finite amount of level one cache limited to a size that can be accessed in a single machine cycle, that area below the blue line reflects the cycle spent waiting for data to be staged from processor cache or memory uh, due to level one cache misses. And so it's termed the finite uh, CPI or estimated finite CPI. So reducing those unproductive cycles, you know, reducing that blue line uh, is the focus of efforts to optimize uh, processor cache. So this chart represents really one of the primary takeaways of this entire presentation, and that is that those waiting on cache cycles represent a very significant 
portion of overall CPI. Uh, it, I've seen it range maybe as low as around 30% to upwards of 50% of total CPU consumption on Z13 and subsequent models. So that establishes the potential, the magnitude of the potential opportunity if improvements in processor cache efficiency can be uh, achieved. Now, because the opportunity for processor cycle speed improvements going forward in Z models is pretty limited, uh, processor cache efficiencies are playing an ever increasing role in the incremental capacity that's delivered by each new Z processor uh, generation. So combining those two factors means that now more than ever being effective in optimizing CPU at the infrastructure level requires understanding the key processor cache count concepts and having good visibility uh, into the key metrics. Now, depending on a, a number of factors, including business workloads and many infrastructure considerations, uh, in some environments, the opportunities for CPU savings are big. Uh, other cases, they're smaller, and sometimes the opportunities may be minimal. So there's no silver bullet. There's no one-size-fits-all you know, massive improvement uh, to, to be implemented. But understanding the cache key cache concepts and having good visibility of the metrics uh, and being familiar with configuration changes and approaches that others have used to enhance cache efficiency positions you to identify any opportunities that may exist in your environment. So the goal of this session is to help you to be in a position to be able to do that analysis and to achieve whatever savings are possible uh, in your environment. Now, another key uh, cache metric is RNI, relative nest intensity, and that quantifies how deep into the shared processor cache and memory hierarchy, which IBM calls the nest, uh, the processor needs to go to receive, retrieve data and instructions when they're not present in level one cache. And thus, um, RNI is sometimes referred to the nest depth uh, metric. It reflects the fact that access times can increase significantly or do increase significantly with each subsequent level of um, processor cache, and that means more waiting um, by the pro process. Thank you. Sorry about that. Had to cough and then didn't get myself unmuted. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Let me get something for my throat. I'll be right back. I apologize. All right, apologize for that. Voice box is just a little bit slow getting warmed up for me this morning. All right, so RNI is used along with the level one miss percentage to categorize a workload as high, medium, or low in terms of the demand that it places on processor cache. And that classification is used in the uh, IBM Large Systems Performance Reference Chart, the LSR, to uh, assess a, a, a workload in, in those high, medium, and low uh, categories. So here's what that table looks like, and it combines, you can see L1 MP, level one miss percentage on the left, and then the numeric RNI, and then based on those settings, then you identify whether you have a high, medium, or, or high average or low um, uh, cash demand on cash. And uh, the significance here is that high and medium workloads typically have larger opportunities for savings uh, than low workloads do. 
All right, so a key concept to understand if we want to enhance process or cash efficiency is hyperdispatch. And hyperdispatch is a partnership between the ZOS and the PRISM dispatchers to align work um, to um, logical CPs and to align uh, logical to physical uh, CPs. And that's important because it increases the likelihood that uh, units of work will be redispatched back on the same logical CP and execute on the same or a nearby uh, physical CP. And that optimizes the effectiveness of processor cache at every level. It reduces the frequency of processor cache misses, and then it reduces the distance into the nest uh, to require to fetch data when a miss uh, occurs. So when hyperdispatch is active, which it almost always is nowadays, PRISM assigns logical CPs as vertical highs, mediums, or lows based on two considerations, LPAR weights and the number of physical CPs. So vertical high logical CPs have a one-to-one -one relationship with a physical CP. Vertical medium has at least a 50% share and vertical low has no guaranteed share and it. it just exists to be able to exploit unused capacity from other LPARs that are not using their share. And the importance here is that work that runs on vertical highs uh, optimizes processor cache effectiveness because it's one-to-one -one relationship with a physical CP means it will be consistently accessing the same processor cache. Um, on the other hand, work that runs on vertical mediums and vertical lows may be dispatched on various physical CPs where it's going to be contending with work from other LPARs and thus uh, there's contention for the processor cache, which um, makes the likelihood of finding the data in cache uh, lower. All right, so already mentioned that we're not likely to see uh, imp significant cycle speed improvements. And so cash efficiencies play a major role in the uh, increases in delivered capacity that come from newer generations of Z processors. So let, let's look at what uh, some of those changes have been the key ones uh, for the 14 uh, and the 15. All right, so first, uh, PRISM LPAR placement algorithms have been improved to uh, reduce cache waiting cycles as you know, reflected in the finite CPI. So one change prioritizes the effort to fit an LPAR within a single drawer. This uh, reduces the expensive remote accesses that are involved uh, when you have to travel, traverse to a different drawer, which uh, make uh, involve many, many uh, waiting cycles. Uh, so the increases in cores per chip from eight on the Z13 to 10 on the Z14 and 12 on the Z15 uh, increases the size of an LPAR that will fit on a, in a single drawer. So that makes this more uh, achievable. Another PRISM L, uh, L, uh, algorithm change from the 13 uh, which went into effect in the 14, is to prioritizing placing GCPs, um, vertical high and vertical medium, on uh, in the same, you know, as close to each other in, as possible. Uh, previously on the Z13, uh, vertical highs for GCPs and ZIPs were uh, prioritized. And so then that resulted in, in many cases where a vertical high GCP and a vertical medium GCP might be in different drawers and that, uh, in, uh, resulted in long wait times. Also um, on the Z15, uh, PRISM seeks to optimize LPAR placement now down to the CP chip boundary. So again, more and more intelligence built in to, um, to have the um, data as um, close as possible together in the, in the physical uh, topology. Also, uh, another key change that came in on the Z14 is a unified level four cache. And so, and that enables point to point access um, for remote uh, drawers. Um, and uh, so we're gonna discuss that further in the next slides. Also, the four, uh, four, both the 14 and 15 involve strategic increases to selected cache sizes. Um, and then finally, another key change that went in on the Z14 is that level one translation look aside buffer control information has been merged into level one cache, which eliminates level one translation look aside buffer uh, misses. 
All right, so this uh, reference slide from uh, David Hutton of IBM highlights key differences between the Z13 on the top and the Z14 and um, the much continuity between the 14 and 15 um, on the bottom. So the one, there's a lot of good, really good information here that we're not going to have time to cover today, but the key one I want to point out to on the right hand side there is that the Z14 and Z15 have a single unified level four cache per drawer versus the two separate uh, level fours as you saw up uh, above that uh, in a Z13 drawer. So let's just look at the rationale for that briefly here. So the ZC12 in, in prior models actually all the way back to Z10 provided point to point or star access uh, between all the, uh, at that time it was books, now it's drawers, right? So all accesses to remote cache were a, you know, could be reached directly. Think of it as a nonstop flight, right? But then on the Z13, depending on the node in which a da the data resided, remote accesses could now require uh, multiple hops, first to the drawer and then across to the other node uh, in that drawer. So, you know, think of that as a connecting flight, right? And those could take hundreds of uh, cycles uh, to access that data. So that helped explain why LPAR topology played such a big role in Z13 uh, performance and why some high RNI workloads um, had challenges when, and when they migrated to Z13. The Z14 and Z15 design that unifies level four cache in the, in the system controller now restores that point-to-point -point connectivity between all the level four caches. So again, back to a nonstop flight for whenever you do have to go access data uh, from another drawer. All right, and then here are just from reference are the cache size increases on the Z14 and Z15, almost every level of cache. Uh, has increased across these uh, in size across these two generation of upgrades. Okay, so now let's look at a couple of case studies that show the impact of um, Z15 upgrades on delivered uh, capacity with particular focus on how processor cache efficiency plays uh, into that. Um, so the first case study, this involves Z13 to Z15 upgrades of two CPCs um, in, this, in, in the same environment so run, and running similar uh, business workloads. So both of these upgrades were essentially lateral from a capacity perspective, six and 8% increases uh, respectively. Now, since new processor models deliver increased capacity per CP, uh, due to, again, cash efficiencies uh, typically play a huge role in that. Lateral upgrades of capacity generally result in a decrease in the number of physical CPs. And that typically then translates into less work running on vertical highs, which as we talked about at the beginning, um, then that increases cross LPAR contention for cash and, and thus uh, can impact uh, cash efficiency. So that's always something to watch carefully when you're doing a lateral upgrade. How many uh, physical CPs are you reducing and, if, uh, and especially how many fewer vertical highs uh, do you have? So in this case, um, the uh, upgrades resulted in for both of these two CPCs resulted in two fewer physical CPs, and that happened to map uh, to two fewer vertical highs. That's not always a one-to-one, -one, but uh, there's, um, in this case, it was. Now, in this case, fortunately, the uh, reduction in workload running on vertical highs was relatively small, only 2% less on the first and 5% less um, on the second. Um, and then finally, the last two columns reflect the increase in the MSU per CP ratings for these two upgrades. Um, and again, so of course, one ex anticipates that those, um, that those increases are gonna be offset by reductions in cycles per uh, instruction CPI so that um, you will still have a, you know, a net increase in um, delivered capacity. So now one, one um, characteristic of a workload that's really important to be aware of as you an, analyze what's going on in processor cache uh, is the increase in finite CPI for the work that's not running 
on vertical highs. So I'm going to call this the VM, the vertical medium penalty. Um, it recognizes it applies to both vertical medians and vertical lows, um, but it reflects that negative impact because now you have contention for processor cache from work that can that's running on other uh, from other LPARs, right? You're dispatched for a while on a physical CP if you got a vertical medium or vertical low, and then some other LPARs dispatch, and then you get back by the time you're back, right? The odds are that a great deal of your data has already been flushed um, out of uh, the cache. And so that's uh, something to be aware of. And um, so if there is a significant VM penalty, it's going to be uh, immediately apparent on this chart, which is finite CPI by logical CP. Um, so the, and in that case, there can be a big gap between the finite CPI for the vertical highs versus the vertical mediums and the vertical lows. Now, in this case, there, there isn't a big gap that's apparent. Uh, you don't see the two, the two sets of logicals, uh, you know, kind of separating from themselves. Um, and when we actually do the math here, it was on the Z13, it was only 14%. That's not a big uh, VM uh, penalty. Um, we're going to see a different um, outcome uh, when we look at the second uh, case study. All right, so other metrics, uh, both of these CPCs uh, had a significant reduction in level one miss percentage, uh, frequency of level one cache misses. Um, and again, the increases in the cache sizes um, can certainly, I'm sure, play an important role in that, maybe other architectural improvements as well. Um, so for CPCA in this example, you can see now that the L1MP kind of crossed the magic 3% threshold from that LSPR chart. Um, once you get an L, uh, L1MP below 3%, then your workload is only going to be either average or low. It can't be high because, um, again, you, you're, you don't have, you're not having to go that often past level one, right? Uh, your, your level one misses um, are lows, are low. All right, so now here's a comparison of the um, aggregate CPI between uh, combining the two CPCs um, from of 13s and 15s. Again, the red lines are the total CPI, the blue lines are finite uh, CPI. So for instruction complexity CPI, again, the, the productive cycles actually executing your business inst uh, instructions, um, the way the lines shift down here, it's not immediately apparent. Um, how the relationship is between those. So when we look at that in the table on the next slide, we can see that better. However, we do see a clear reduction in the finite CPI, the blue line um, at the bottom, fewer cycles waiting uh, for data to be staged uh, into level one cache. Um, and uh, see at the bottom there, the, the yellow line is the uh, TL, TLB data misses. And again, um, that's a component of finite CPI, and you can see that went down because you don't have level one misses anymore. You only have level two misses. All right, so looking at this now in tabular form, there was a modest increase um, for both CPCs um, associated with a move uh, for instruction complexity CPI for both CPCs, so that associated with a move the Z15. So some of the architectural enhancements benefited this particular business uh, workload. But we can see in particular, there was uh, significant improvements in finite uh, CPI. Um, uh, and again, we talked about different factors. There's cash size increases, um, uh, algorithm improvements, um, and so on. Uh, so rolled up. Um, this resulted in CPI uh, cycles per instruction improvements uh, exceeding 20% on both uh, CPI, uh, both CPCs, excuse me. So now let's translate that into delivered capacity. So kind of the approach here, the top line is that CPI metric from the previous uh, slide. Um, and then the next row here, we're going to invert that, invert that. So now you turn that into instructions per machine cycle. Um, and then uh, adjust that for the cycle speed between a 13 and a 15. There's an increase from 5.0 to 5.2 uh, gigahertz there. Um, and so you do the multiplication and come up with uh, instructions, um, in this case, in, in billions, uh, just to not avoid any kind of confusion uh, with the whole uh, MIPS uh, metrics. Um, so here you can see that uh, in, in the green there, the uh, increase in the instructions being executed on the two CPCs, 31 and 36%. And you compare that with how much the MSU rating went up per CP, uh, which in both cases was 29%. So you can see here that 
uh, in this uh, case study that uh, they're experiencing uh, a bit more delivered capacity than the ratings box ratings would, would have indicated. So that's likely leading to a slightly lower MSU consumption for a uh, consistent uh, business workload. All right, so that's one case study. Let's look at a second one. In this case, it's again a 13 to a 15, but just a single CPC. Uh, Initially here, this is just a, re uh, a report of total MSU consumption. Um, when the LPARs were on the Z13, that was in blue. And then when they migrated to the Z15, now it's in red. So by the time all the LPARs have been migrated, we can see that the total MSU consumption in uh, the red is much lower than the blue uh, from the Z13. So even before we look at the cash metrics here, uh, this significant decrease in MSU consumption uh, previews a very good outcome, right? All right. So um, he, in this example, uh, you know, it's kind of borderline lateral, 11% um, capacity uh, improvement. Um, again, jumping two generations, that uh, means a reduction of uh, three physical CPs. In this case, the way their LPAR weights were set up was actually a reduction of five um, vertical highs. Uh, between the 13 and the 15, but yet again, uh, the percent of work running on vertical highs uh, decreased only by 3%. So again, that was a fortunate outcome there. And then again, here are those MSU per CP ratings that we will incorporate into our analysis um, at, a, at the later, later stage. All right, so in case study one, we noticed that there was a, a, a small VM penalty. You can see in this case, it's very apparent there's a significant gap between the two sets of logical CPs. Uh, and so that just visually tells you right off the bat before you even do the math that you've got a significant uh, VM penalty uh, in this environment uh, when the work was running on a Z13. And so when you do the math, uh, it, was a, it was over 50%. So the work running on that was not running on a vertical high, the finite CPI was 50% higher. And again, in an environment, let's say where finite CPI represents half of total uh, CPI, then you take half of that. So that means in this environment, the work that was running, that was not running on vertical highs was taking about 25% more CPU than the work running on a vertical high. So that's a, that's a significant um, uh, VM penalty um, on the Z13. Now, when we look at the Z, when we look at the Z15 chart uh, for that same system, now that that big gap no longer appears, right? Um, and so, when we do the math here, now the the, the that penalty dropped by uh, more than half. So perhaps the Prism algorithm change we talked about earlier that uh, places a greater priority on closer proximity between the vertical highs and vertical mediums contributed uh, to this environment. Um, but anyway, that reduction in the VM penalty is going to be, um, we're going to expect to see that uh, reflected in the finite CPI numbers that we're going to look at shortly. So again, if we look at uh, level one miss percentage, again, it's comparable to the first uh, study, about a 15% reduction. So again, that means that many, that many fewer times when you have to go uh, fetch data from some other level of cash, it's already there and you can keep going productively executing uh, the instructions. All right, again, here's that um, 13 to 15 um, total CPI in red, finite CPI uh, in the blue. Um, and again, um, we'll look at we'll, in the table in a minute to see what happened with the instruction complexity CPI, but the finite CPI, you can tell, was a, a very sizable uh, improvement. When we look at that here and now in the table, instruction complexity CPI, again, this workload did benefit from those jumping forward, those two uh, generations uh, in terms of uh, that side of it. But again, you can see a very significant improvement in the uh, finite CPI. Again, we, the reduction of the, uh, the VM penalty played, plays into that, cash size increases uh, and so on. So again, using the same methodology here, uh, CPI, invert that, reflect, uh, adjust for the cycle speed, come up with your total instructions that you're getting executed. Uh, and again, in this case, now that improvement was 46% and the box rating went up, you know, approximately 29%. So in this environment, the Z15 uh, was delivering capacity that was 
significantly uh, exceeded what the box rating increase uh, was. So again, we saw that at the beginning, we kind of got an indication of that when the MSUs went way down. So here's that, you know, that chart again. So uh, in this case, you know, a picture's worth a thousand wor words, or in this case, maybe a picture's worth a um, thousand metrics. Uh, but anyway, so in this environment, they uh, achieved a significantly better outcome out of the Z15 than what the increase uh, box rating would have uh, indicated. Now, just mention in passing, I don't have the, it's not completed yet, but it's nearing completion. Another uh, Z15 upgrades uh, analysis working on with a customer. In this case, it's a 14 to a 15. Um, in that environment, the delivered capacity is coming in uh, slightly below uh, the increase um, in the box rating and was we haven't had a chance to review it yet with the customer. So it's um, not yet finalized, but uh, when it is, we'll incorporate that into future um, versions of this. Um, so anyway, again, it, it have to analyze the metrics in each environment and see uh, see what the outcome uh, is. Okay, so um, that's uh, those two case studies. We'll have one more at the end here um, uh, when we get to uh, subcapacity models. Um, but now I want to talk about um, you know building on the concepts we've talked about. You know what are ways that you can maximize work that's uh, executing on uh, vertical high um, logical uh, C CPs. And, um, and yeah, so that'll be the first uh, thing we, we look at look at there. And again, that reduces the contention uh, from other LPARs and it also improves things from a LPAR topology point of view because vertical highs tend to be uh, co-located. Um, so if we're going to optimize a vertical CP assignments so that we can maximize the amount of work running on vertical highs, again, as we mentioned earlier, two variables come into play, LPAR weights and the number of physical uh, CPs. So we're going to look at each one of those uh, in turn. First, we're going to look at LPAR uh, weights here. Um, and um, you know, time doesn't allow in this presentation to go through the methodology for determining vertical CP assignments. Um, it's uh, in the backup slides that will be made um, available here. Um, also, or you can, uh, there's an I, uh, IBM LPAR design tool that you can use to kind of do that work for you. But in any case, it's, it's, it's very important that you understand that methodology because leveraging vertical CP assignments is very important in optimizing cash um, effectiveness. All right, so here are some considerations as we think about setting LPAR weight values. Again, trying to maximize the amount of work executing um, on vertical high. So one approach here is to increase, adjust LPAR weights to increase the number of vertical highs for large uh, LPARs. And prime candidates here in particular are big LPARs that currently have a significant workload that's executing on vertical mediums and vertical lows, um, especially ones that have a high VM penalty like we uh, saw in case study two. Um, and then particularly LPARs that have a guaranteed share just below the cutoff for receiving an additional vertical high. So for example, um, and again, the, the, L, the methodology shows how to calculate this, right? But if you have an LPAR with a guaranteed share of 6.4, um, that's going to get five vertical highs. But a potentially small adjustment to the LPAR weight to increase that share from 6.4 to 6.5, now all of a sudden, then that gets you an additional a sixth uh, vertical high. So sometimes just some tweaks in LPAR weights that where they're close to the boundary uh, can get you additional work running on vertical highs. Also then just take in, again, understanding how the, uh, how the uh, vertical CP assignments are made, sometimes tailoring LPAR weights can increase the overall number of vertical highs um, on, uh, by, assigned by PRISM on a CPC. And we'll see an example of this on the next slide. Also, if the characteristics of the workloads um, on your LPARs change in a repeatable manner, for example, you know, a common scenario can be you've got an online workload uh, during the day on one LPAR, and then you've got a large batch workload on a different LPAR at night. Um, LPAR weight changes can be automated to better align the vertical CP configuration with the workload. Um, and so, um, 
again, that can be uh, another way to maximize the amount of work running on vertical highs. And we're going to look at an example of how the engine dispatch uh, analysis report can be used to help uh, assess this. Also, if you have the opportunity, and I uh, recognize that sometimes business workloads don't permit this, but if you can, fewer larger LPARs can increase uh, the amount of work executing um, on vertical highs. And then finally, just be aware that activating idle LPARs with substantial weights can have a big negative impact on cash and CPU efficiency. I'm gonna cite several examples of this when we get to that point, because I continue to see sites shooting themselves in the foot in this area. All right, so here's an example where small adjustments to LPAR weights uh, can make a big difference in the amount of work executing on vertical high. So now, this is an ordinary um, four LPAR configuration on a Z13. This is, was a real, real life example. Um, and they had the weights, the, the weights came up to 30, 30, 20, 20 in terms of the percent share. And so at first glance that maybe appears innocent, um, but on the Z13, after a 2016 microcode change, which was designed to reduce those VM penalties that we talked about earlier, these LPAR weights would result in zero vertical highs because every CP share is less than two. Again, this is a special rule on the Z13. So in this example, just relatively small uh, adjustments to the LPAR weights go from zero vertical highs to two vertical high. So now, now instead of having no work running on vertical highs, you could have, you know, a, a third of your work uh, running on vertical highs. And in this particular, uh, you know, again, real life example, the finite CPI VM penalty was um, 20%. So, and there was a significant amount of CPU that was, could save by just making this a small adjustment. Now, Opportunities in this area are typically not this dramatic, but the point here is it's very important for you to understand how vertical CP assignments are made. So that will prevent you from defining LPAR weights that drive suboptimal vertical CP configurations like this one. All right, we talked about that point of um, potent the potential opportunity to automate weight changes so that you align the uh, workload that's executing with the guaranteed share. Um, and so this is an engine dispatch analysis that's regularly uh, recommended by uh, Kathy Walsh in her conference presentations. And so it consists of four variables um, and it's uh, the IBM tech doc uh, referenced here um, has several recommendations for configuring LPAR. So we'll just, let's just walk through it for this uh, sample LPAR. So one metric here is the number of physical CPs. That's the uh, yellow uh, line at the top. Um, second is the number of logical CPs uh, that are defined uh, for the LPAR. So one recommendation in the tech doc is to not configure all the logical available physicals as logicals. And so this, in this example, that is followed. But another recommendation in that uh, tech doc is to define the number of logical CPs equal to the numbers sat required to satisfy a guaranteed share plus you know one or two additional logical CPs, which by definition will be configured as vertical low. So th in this example, the guaranteed share, the green line was three and the logicals are nine. So there's six extra uh, logicals here. So that varies a good bit from the recommendation um, in the tech doc. All right, so that the LPAR share there is in green. Um, and then finally, the uh, red line, that's the fourth variable, and that's the actual CPU consumption in units of CPs. Um, and again, the tech doc points out that uh, work runs most efficiently from a processor cache perspective it, if it runs within its LPAR share, because then it's executing on vertical highs and vertical mediums, again, that have assigned locations, you know, ideally close to the vertical highs. Um, and so it avoids the use of vertical lows except for occasional uh, workload spikes. So we can see here a good bit of the time, at least during the day, uh, the, the CPU consumption in the red line is below the guaranteed share, the green line, um, but then you know, at different times uh, off of prime, then um, there, the CPU is going significantly above uh, the guaranteed share. So just on top of this chart, now I'm overlaying a chart that shows the amount of work that's executing on highs 
mediums and lows. And you can see the direct correlation between the times when the um, CPU, the red line was above the green line. And, and then the, you can see that that work, you know, significant amounts of work then are running um, on vertical lows uh, during those periods. So again, this could be an opportunity. Um, it's not consistent off, outside of prime hours. It could be an opportunity to adjust the guaranteed uh, share uh, to a different value, uh, just depending on what other factors uh, are going on in uh, other LPARs um, in that environment. All right, I'm going to spend um, a, a good bit of time on this last area again, because um, which is to uh, which is when idle LPARs are activated with large weights, or when idle LPARs are not deactivated after testing is completed. Right, and again, I just see uh, sites uh, continue to see sites that are negatively impacting their cash and CPU efficiency in ways that are uh, entirely uh, avoidable. So in this example, uh, planning for a configuration change was underway. Uh, they were gonna split their primary production workload across two LPARs. And so to prepare for this change, which was gonna go live in a few months, a new LPAR, LPO4 was defined. Um, so that's, that's fine, but it was activated with a production weight was activated with the weight reflecting the workload that it was going to be executing several months from now. But currently, it was basically idle, so it was not executing that work. So the opportunity here, right, is that the entire production workload that's still running on LP01 now only has access to four vertical highs, so that a sizable workload is running on vertical mediums and vertical lows. So after these LPAR weights were adjusted to reflect the current workload uh, configuration, and now that the production workload on LP01 could leverage nine vertical highs instead of four, the uh, CPU consumption for that production workload decreased by more than 5%. And that translated into a six figure annual reduction uh, in MLC expense. Again, in the of course, the time required to implement this change is very, very minimal. Now, I recently saw another example of this where LPARs uh, were activated for what was anticipated to be a few days of testing or, or was a few days of scheduled testing. But due to a coordination lapse between teams, those idle LPARs remained activated four months after the testing had been completed. And so that cost them five vertical highs on a production CPC for several months, right? Again, significant CPU impact from that. Um, and then in another shop, uh, while preparing for upcoming configuration changes, new soon to be production LPARs were activated to validate the IO configuration. But again, instead of being activated with validate and IO configuration weight, they were activated with their ultimate production weights. And that significantly impacted the vertical CP configurations of the live production LPARs. And so in that site, that meant a 20% increase in CPU consumption across four production systems. So I just kind of belabor the point here. It's very important that everyone in your site with authority to activate LPARs realizes the impact LPAR weights have on vertical CP configurations with the potential significant impacts on cash efficiency and CPU consumption. So again, I see this repeatedly, even in big shops, even with experienced staffs, um, but it's experienced staffs who don't have good visibility into their processor cash configurations and metrics. Uh, in their environments. If they did, they would quickly recognize and correct uh, these issues, any such issues like this that would arise. All right, so that was the topic of how do I, uh, how can I leverage LPAR weights um, to optimize cash efficiency? The second major area, again, the second factor in determining vertical CP configurations is the number of physical CPs. Um, 
uh, and again, that has uh, increased, helps increase the work executing vertical life, and it also increases just the amount of chip level cash, chip level one, level two uh, cash. So s several ways this can be achieved. Um, activating on off capacity on demand at monthly uh, peak intervals as one approach um, in uh, installing or deploying additional uh, capacity and uh, increasing the number of physical cps with subcapacity models are you know potential alternatives depending on factors um, at a given site let's walk through these briefly um, if you're um, on a peak four hour rolling average based software license model where software expense is driven primarily by CPU consumption at the monthly peak, um, one cost-effective way for leveraging additional physical capacity can be through on-off capacity on demand. If your monthly peaks occur at predictable time intervals, when you know that you know you know when they're going to be happening, then on-off capacity on demand can increase the number of physical CPs you have during that time and thus the work runs more efficiently on vertical highs and you can thereby reduce your uh, MSU consumption uh, potentially or your peak MSU for monthly peak MSUs, right? And again, so doing this um, is more uh, vertical highs um, and also, uh, you know, more uh, cash and, and reduce uh, finite CPI. So um, in, a, in previous uh, conference presentations, I've um, published a case study where this approach uh, saved uh, one site um, several hundred thousand dollars uh, a year annually. All right, a second way to increase the number of physical CPs is to install or deploy uh, additional hardware capacity, potentially surplus hardware uh, capacity. So again, just this really basically involves just a change in mindset, right? To traditional mainframe capacity planning has always been predicated on the assumption that running mainframes at high utilizations is the most cost effective way uh, to operate, um, right? In, in, back in the days when hardware was the dominant expense factor, that made sense. Uh, in today's world, where almost always software is by far the dominant expense factor, then this really needs to be um, re-examined. Um, and again, there, there are case studies that indicate in certain environments that um, there's a significant uh, cost benefit from spending a bit more on hardware um, and, and, and then achieving uh, one time on hardware and, and achieving uh, ongoing recurring uh, software savings. Um, so that's, the, you know, that's one example of making an additional capacity uh, acquisition. Um, the other point here is that many sites um, don't require that business case because they already have a business practice of pre-purchasing additional capacity uh, uh, that they don't immediately deploy perhaps as, because to get a volume discount uh, or long-term lease uh, to avoid procurement from frequent ap acquisitions or to acquire capacity uh, for seasonal peaks and which is then deactivated uh, for the remainder of the year. So uh, even then, so the, 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 the challenge here, right? Or the, what I'm encouraging you to rethink is that just in time approach, rather than owning that capacity, but not getting the benefit of it, uh, for you know maybe significant portions of the year, um, if you, in depending on the cash metrics and behaviors in your environment, you could achieve significant software savings by deploying that already purchased uh, capacity. So, uh, in either case, whether it's uh, you know acquiring additional capacity or deploying previously acquired uh, capacity, uh, again, I encourage you to look at the numbers, right? Look at what the, the one-time cost on the hardware uh, versus the recurring uh, costs um, on the software. So I've seen detailed data from at least three large shops where deploying additional hardware capacity has achieved, um, you know, seven figure savings in dollars or euros um, um, because of the cash efficiencies um, that resu have resulted from that. All right, and then the third uh, potential approach here is um, leveraging subcapacity models. So um, if overall capacity and single engine speeds or other considerations don't require full capacity models, 
uh, subcapacity models can be utilized, which add physical CPs without incurring additional hardware expense. That adds, again, adds physical CPs uh, without additional expense. And then, and keep in mind that uh, even if uh, the pr you know production CPCs in your environment are not eligible for subcapacity models, your dev test CPCs may still be. And dev test uh, environments can be great applications for this because you uh, often have many small LPARs there, and so you can go from situations where you basically can have almost no vertical highs to getting some significant work executing on vertical highs in that kind of environment. So again, the benefits here, when you have more physical CPs, you get more chip level cash, which is level one and level two. Um, um, you know, and that gives you lower L1 MP and more work running on vertical highs because your vertical CP configuration is better um, and so on. So again, subcapacity models were originally created by IBM to provide customers more granularity in acquiring capacity. But you know, under the category of unintended consequences, um, in some cases, uh, we sites are leveraging these to obtain potential processor cache um, advantages. So let's. This will be a one more case study, uh, and just kind of think through the thought process involved. Um, and the impact on the processor cache metrics for uh, delivering this. And uh, uh, for more details on this study, uh, uh, I'll point you to the Cheryl Watson's tuning letter article that's referenced in the sources slide at the end um, um, for that. So to start off, uh, so this was an environment they were currently on a Z13709. So that's the amount of cache, level one, level two, level three cache, the top row there. The two alternatives being evaluated, if you went kind of your standard way, which I'm going to still stay full speed. So Z14, that'd be a 708. It was a qu basically equivalent capacity. The middle row tells you how much ca cash you'd have there. A bit of increases because the 13 to 14, there were some cash size increases. But then the bottom row was the uh, equivalent capacity, subcapacity model of, with a 5XX model. And you can see level one cash uh, triples, uh, level two cash uh, you know, almost quadrupled level three cash uh, triples, you know, for that kind of environment. So just immediately, you know, intuitively you say, well, I'm probably going to get some benefit out of that. I'm probably going to get better hit ratios and better residency time when I have that much more cash. So then this site, they evaluated, they decided that the, the speed of the subcapacity model, their product, their workload would still be fine on that. So, so here's what first initially, here's what happened on level one miss percentage went down um, this amount. And this was during this, uh, this peak period, there were other peak intervals where it went down as much as 15%. Uh, percent. So again, that's always a benefit. You keep your pr processor busy executing uh, instructions. So again, here is a before and after. Uh, they went from nine physical CPs to 23. Uh, the number of vertical highs based on their configuration went up from six to 20. Um, and then the uh, amount of work executing on um, vertical highs went up very uh, dramatically. So here was their um, finite CPI biological CP. They didn't have a big uh, VM penalty here, not a big gap between the highs uh, and the mediums. Um, and uh, so, you know, just a 15% 15, uh, 15 penalty here. The big benefit they experienced, right, was now almost all their work was running um, on vertical highs after, uh, after the upgrade. Uh, so cycles uh, per instruction um, uh, he, he went down um, by 11%. Um, and again, as we look at the, look at the breakdown of how that um, worked out um, on the um, Z13, the instruction complexity CPI was 1.6, and the finite CPI was about 1.6. On the, the subcapacity model, the instruction complexity CPI remained around 1.6, but now the finite CPI dropped um, to 1.2. Again, way more cash and way more work executing um, on vertical highs. So again, here you see the uh, benefit to uh, finite CPI, the reduction um, in the waiting cycles, um, and um, that uh, turned into this kind of an improvement in uh, delivered uh, capacity. Again, the 
migration from a hardware capacity point of view and thus a hardware expense point of view was very was very much lateral but with the subcapacity model um, the big improvement in the finite cpi um, and thus their delivered capacity um, for their environment went up uh, dramatically. So again, you know, each the, the characteristics of each workload uh, in each environment are different. You have to look at the metrics. There's no one size fits all solution. But these we've, as we've talked about today, many different types of ways that many sites have have achieved uh, CPU reduction and thus software expense reduction through um, optimizing uh, processor cache. And so in this environment here was the reduction in MSUs, uh, be, you know, that's just reflected from that pre this, this previous chart right here. This is how it showed up in terms of MSU consumption for a comparable uh, business workload. Um, and so it reduced their um, rolling peak for our rolling average by more than 20%. Uh, so they're realizing far more capacity from the subcapacity model, even though the rated capacity uh, was essentially the same um, as uh, the uh, full capacity Z13 model. So again, kind of all of these point, point, uh, different approaches and different case studies all point out the importance of processor cache plays in CPU consumption in today's Z processors, and thus the importance of you having good visibility um, in, your, in, in your environment. So again, just kind of summarizing the key, key points here. Um, uh, in the case studies we looked at from 13 to 15, um, the results exceeded uh, that expected in one case, just slightly, in one case, significantly. It won't always be the case, but those two, it was. Um, and then also um, the subcapacity case study uh, showed, again, just really emphasizes that processor cache efficiency uh, plays a very important role in uh, delivery capacity for Z processor. So again, as always, your mileage may vary. There's no single one action that'll be great for everyone, um, but every action covered today in this presentation achieves significant CPU savings for someone. And you won't know whether you have small or big savings opportunities uh, unless you understand the metrics and have good visibility uh, into the, in the values uh, in your uh, environment. So again, this, this is just a reference slide on um, the capabilities that Intel Magic Vision provides to help you have good visibility in the processor cache metrics and uh, throughout uh, to get great value out of your SMF and RMF value. Here are the sources uh, that we've uh, talked about today and um, very near uh, the top of the hour. Um, and uh, Pierre has sent out the link to invite feedback um, for the today's uh, presentation really um, appreciate uh, your attending uh, and uh, let's see Pierre I don't think we've got any uh, qu questions that have come in is that correct yeah no questions uh, coming, okay. out, coming in at the moment we have got two minutes left so if people want to um, yeah submit their questions then I can oh, okay uh, wait for around 30 seconds yeah sure Yeah, it's a fascinating area and it's just very interesting as each new IBM model comes out, just to see the ways that IBM is leveraging uh, cache sizes and other algorithm changes and other approaches to continue to make um, the processor cache more and more uh, efficient and thus deliver more capacity um, in, each, in each model, uh, despite not being able to ramp up the cycle speeds significantly anymore. Okay, I don't think we have any questions coming through, but thank you so much for your time, Todd. We really appreciate it. I was really detailed and insightful, and I invite all the attendees to um, certainly leave some feedback. That'd be really appreciated as well. Um, if you've got anything um, else to say, Todd? No, that's it. Thanks for the opportunity, Pierre. Fantastic. Well, I wish everyone uh, in the chat uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And um, yeah, of course, thank you for joining.